Good afternoon and welcome to the latest webinar from BioExcel. Um, today we're uh, going to be talking about open facts uh, and in particular building pharmacological workflow blocks for virtual screening. This is a in this webinar we actually have three speakers presenting today. We have uh, Nick Lynch uh, as our guest speaker and we also have Stian Solandres and Adam Hospital from the BioExcel project. Um, so um, I'm going to just spend a couple of minutes now telling you about BioExcel uh, and then I'll hand over to the, the speakers for today's presentation. Before I get underway though, I'll just want to remind you that this, um, this webinar is being recorded, including the question and answer session at the end, uh, and we'll post it on YouTube and the BioExcel website afterwards. So for those of you who may not be so familiar with BioExcel, I just wanted to give you a very quick overview, one slide really. Um, so BioExcel is a new center of excellence for computational biomolecular research, and it's sort of based around three main pillars. The first one is excellence in biomolecular software, and it's uh, an important part of what the center is intending to do, to be working on important codes for the community. Uh, in this first phase, of the center, we have three codes, uh, Gromax for MD simulations, HADAP for docking, and CPMD for QMMM simulations. Um, uh, but as, as the project goes on, it's likely that we will also be involved with, with other software as well. The second pillar is excellence in usability. So um, as well as having good software, we want to make sure that it is usable and one of the important ways that we plan to do this is to build uh, building blocks that can be used as part of workflows um, and uh, that is related to, to some of what you're going to hear about today uh, in particular how um, open facts uh, can be used as a, as a data source as a, in one of these workflows for example and the final part of what we're doing is consultancy and training um, i'm uh, leading that work package, so the webinars are, are part of this activity, but we've also got training courses and things going on all the time, so please do check our website if you're interested in finding out more. BioExcel also has some interest groups. Um, if you're interested in any of these topics that you can see on this slide here, you can sign up at bioexcel.eu slash, uh, well, go to bioexcel.eu and you can see where to sign up for the interest groups. So um, we very much hope that you'll have some questions after our speakers have uh, given their talks today. Uh, if you've got any questions at any time during the presentation, you can type into the questions box that you'll see in the GoToWebinar control panel. It will look similar, not identical to this, but you should have a questions um, box and you can type in your question. And at the end of the, the webinar, I'll come back. Um, if you have a microphone, I'll invite you to, to ask your question directly to the speaker. Otherwise, I can, uh, you can just type your question into the, the question box and I can relay that to the speaker on your behalf. Finally, if you're watching this video on YouTube after the event and you want to post a question there, you can join the discussion at ask.bioexcel.eu where you can find the discussion forums um, and you can uh, get answers from the speakers at a later date as well. Okay, so now I'm going to sort of move on to the presenters for today's webinar. Uh, Nick Lynch uh, is the current CTO of OpenFacts, which is a semantic linked data and services platform for preclinical pre data. Nick has over 20 years experience in informatics. He was at AstraZeneca for 13 years of that, leading teams in R&D informatics. He established Curlew Research uh, in 2014 working on a number of projects with pharma and biotech and life science informatics companies. Uh, he's also an investment manager for Pistoia Alliance, supporting their projects and strategy, and he's on our scientific advisory board as well. So you can see that Nick is very well placed to be speaking about uh, this, this subject today. And then later on in our presentation, we'll also have two speakers from the BioExcel project. Um, Stian from the University of Manchester's eScience lab, uh, and Adam Hospital um, is from IRB in Barcelona, where he's leading the portable environments efforts there. Okay, so without further ado now, I'm going to hand over today's first speaker. Um, so Nick, I'm about to 
invite you to take control. Okay, thanks, uh, Adam. Okay. Just share Sorry. my screen. Hopefully, you can see my screen, Adam. Is that okay? Yeah, that's all. Okay. You. Yes, great. So, thank you to the BioXL project for in inviting me to present this afternoon, and, and I'm looking forward actually to very much see this as hopefully enabling a good discussion, not, not just to uh, today through your questions, but, but also hopefully as part of a longer term collaboration with between OpenFax and BioXL uh, and the various uh, groups that are using the, the individual components, but hopefully those of you that are, are looking to solve uh, business questions with, with the combination of, of BioXL and, and OpenFax. What I would thought I would do initially is just uh, briefly give a bit of an update on where OpenFax is with uh, our current uh, release and, and platform and a little bit of background into OpenFax itself for those of you perhaps that, that aren't so familiar with OpenFax as a, as a foundation and, and as a project. And then, as I mentioned, we can talk a little bit through some of the applications of OpenFax and, and that will hopefully lead into the work that, uh, that Stian and Adam will be covering as well in terms of uh, bringing together the data and APIs from OpenFAX, as well as those set of uh, simulation tools that Adam mentioned, as well as perhaps broadening the, uh, the wider usage and, and, and collaboration going forward. So I'll, I'll just sort of start off with a little bit of background about uh, at, at Open Facts, really. So uh, for those of you that are involved in, uh, in, I suppose, in scientific research, will understand the challenges that we face in terms of comparing data from, from multiple sources. And we know that there are a lot of public sources of information, that they each have their own history, and they've each uh, have been developed to solve different business questions. And this has always a polls posed a problem for researchers, whether in pharma or, or within academic research, in terms of how to, to, in a way, integrate that data and bring it into a, a central place such that you can then start to ask questions of data that is both relevant uh, and, 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 and interoperable uh, to, to, to be able to get the, to, to be able to get the maximum value from, from data that's coming from different sources. And it's been a challenge that we've been facing for several years. And it was the primary sort of purpose that, that OpenFAX started off as an IMI project uh, in, in 2010, 2011. In that the challenges that the people faced was that for each of their, for each organization, they would need to bring in each of the different data sources uh, into their, you know, possibly put either in within their firewalls if they were perhaps a pharma company, or set up their own environment uh, in general. Bring uh, together these different databases, work out how they were integrated and what was common between them in terms of identifiers, etc., and obviously support the platform and, and do uh, and support the APIs and, and all the sort of exploitation services that would need to live. To, to live on them. And that was a, co a, a problem that was essentially uh, replicated amongst many different groups. And, and in a way, OpenFAX was, was started uh, in, uh, in, in 20, 2011, as I mentioned, to help solve that problem by providing a central resource for a range of pharmacological data sources that both allowed them to be uh, integrated and interoperable as well as providing a set of APIs on, on, on top of them. And I'll talk a little bit about, about how you can use OpenFAX uh, in that context now, and that will lead into some of the uses that you might want to put OpenFAX to when you're using uh, some of the BioXL tools to create uh, this uh, virtual screening workflow uh, that we'll, we'll cover today and, and hopefully uh, in, in future discussions. So, as I say, its it history was being able to create this single uh, single platform with, with multiple data sources. And uh, obviously we're, as part of any IMI project, trying to make sure that we can continue its sustainability longer term. So I think one of the key tenets of, of OpenFAX was the business questions. And, and actually at the time, 
perhaps virtual screening wasn't one of the key business questions that were which were targeted in the in the first few releases but it's certainly very relevant now with with the fact that BioXL is, is now a, a project in its own right and is working hard on making those those tools that Adam mentioned more easy to use and, and more easy to use as part of a, a broad set of, of informatics workflows. So I think what, what BioXL is doing today is very relevant in terms of how OpenFAC started with trying to target a few key questions and you can see them here and there's papers that you, we, we referenced on our, our website that you can look at later around some of the very perhaps common questions that researchers need to ask of the data as, as listed here in terms of finding inhibitors, looking at uh, uh, using structure profiles to find potentially relevant and, and similar compounds in, in, a, in a broader workflow. And I think this is very relevant to a virtual screening workflow where as, as you think about how you might uh, look at the entry points to that problem, you might be starting with a, a particular protein or you might be working on a particular target or you might, might, your entry point might be a set of compounds. All that fits really well with the types of data that's in OpenFAX and obviously then allows you to use some of the outputs from OpenFAX to, uh, to fire off questions to some of the, uh, the BioXL tools like Gromax and others, as well as in, in the opposite direction of potentially using the output of those tools to help feed further analysis questions with open facts and I'll, I'll, I'll come some, cover some more of that later on and I'm sure that's part of the questions that might flow today as well. So just a quick recap of the types of data that uh, you can see in, in open facts and, and probably many of these data sources would be uh, familiar to you as, as researchers. So we, we cover from the traditional sort of pharmacological sources like Kemble and Kebi all the way through pathways and, and patents like, like Shaw Kemble and equally uh, data de or, or data derived around like Dysgenet, which is a disease gene association database from Barcelona uh, and, and other sources as well, and as well as uh, using a range of ontologies to help us uh, glue the data together. So there is a rich set of data that you can uh, access and, and it's, it's something that we're hoping to grow and we definitely welcome your uh, input to that. Uh, and we offer it up as a, as a set of APIs to, to get access to uh, for, for your sort of workflows. So I think, it's, again, not dwelling too much on, on the history of, of open facts, but uh, one of the key value points of, 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 the, of the whole setup is the ability to use one identifier to then be able to sort of expand that in terms of its common, uh, common similar, similar entities which are equally referenced in a range of sources. And that's uh, handled within OpenFacts itself and it's part of the work that the team in OpenFacts does in the background and, and also in partnership with our, our data providers. So that's a key part that you can use a number of entry points to our data which will allow you then to expand out queries and uh, uh, get the most, get a, a range of data that is covered in, in the data sources and that could equally apply to your own private data if you so wish to incorporate that in, in, your, in your tools as well. So uh, what the basic sort of uh, technical platform, and I won't, you can come back to the slides later, is this identity management is a key, uh, key part of the original design of, of, of the tool. So uh, identity management I've already covered, and there's also been quite a lot of work recently uh, in, our, in our recent work around updating our, our identity resolution service. So Ian Dunlop has been working on that uh, recently to move that from using Concept Wiki to using Elasticsearch and we're certainly welcome any input that you have on that uh, as, as you use some of our, uh, our beta versions that, that are out there now. But the, the main access points which I'll perhaps is better explained uh, in, in the next slide is the, the ability to use the API through a range of tools, both the, the traditional workflow tools which could perhaps be very relevant to uh, 
the, the type of examples we're talking about today, where you're not quite sure you, you're going to be running a series of pipelines with potentially quite large sets of, of potential uh, compounds of interest uh, to, to find the best matches, then the, the API works well with workflow tools like NIME and Pipeline Pilot, as well as I know that BioXL have been working with the uh, common workflow language guys too. And, and we've got, there are some good presentations on that that, that, that we, can, we can send you links to later. But those give really good entry points to the API, as well as some of the other apps which were developed as part of, of the project, such as Explorer, and there are other ones from Biosolvit IT and, and, and Etox as well has done, done its own uh, tools that sit atop our, our API. So that gives you the potential to uh, fire off questions from, from workflows that, that, that are relevant to the type of questions that you might ask of the data. So that, that's a, a key aspect of, of the, the offering from, from OpenFAX. The, uh, I think, as I've mentioned before, some of the things that we, we might want to cover in, in, in today's uh, Q&A and, and hopefully in, in future discussions is this ability to marry together the, the data sources and, and API that I've mentioned before along with the, the sets of tools that uh, BioExcel is currently uh, sort of supporting and making easier to access through uh, training and uh, the sort of support in terms of platforms. But I think, as, as, as Adam mentioned earlier, that the potential to grow those set of tools as well in the future based on, on, the, on business challenges that are, are brought to the project, I, I think is a really valuable aspect of, of, of kicking off this approach now. And, and we certainly would be, you know, welcome uh, the ability to work on potential sort of workflows that, that bring together the, the, the API uh, in OpenFAX with, with these simulation tools, either individually, so that, that it's, you know, it's the input or output from one of the tools, or as, as part of a much more complicated workflow potentially in the future where uh, a, a range of the BioXL tools are used and, and used in, in partnership, not just with OpenFAX, but other, uh, other data sources to both uh, use existing data a, 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 in a way that uh, help, helps us with uh, further virtual screening activities. So just a little bit about uh, where OpenFAX is, is now heading in terms of our sort of release schedules as well. And I know, what one thing that I think Stian will, will cover in a minute is the option that this was one thing that uh, was very important to some of the, the users of OpenFAX was the ability to uh, run OpenFAX internally. Often that's the case within uh, pharma companies where there is a need to use the, the sort of internal data and, and merge that with the publicly available data. And, and using Docker was sought to be a very uh, good way of doing that. And uh, I know Stian will cover that and we, there is other information on uh, uh, the OpenFAX website on, on that too and in ways of, of being able to deploy a, a Docker version of, of OpenFAX um, in, in the future too. So just to, to sort of give an update on, on where OpenFAX is today with our, our, our future plans and, and some of the partnerships that we have running as well. So obviously BioXL is an exciting opportunity to, for us to work with uh, these tools, but there are other projects which are either we're partnering with or are using the, the OpenFAX platform. And these are just a, a few examples from the, the Tox-based projects who are obviously keen to get access to a, a broad range of data to support uh, tox prediction and, and risk prediction, as well as a more uh, broader project, which is uh, the Big Data Europe, which is looking at uh, the, the, the whole setup of, of sort of big data projects and, and access to a society, societal data, both covering healthcare and other data in, in, a, single sort, in a single platform. So there's lots of ways that hopefully we can in the future bring together uh, business questions that need access to a wide variety of, of data sources as well. And, and I think one thing that's, that's relevant to what we're trying to do uh, in this, in spring onwards, it has been the recent work that we've been doing with our partner Data to Discovery, who are, who are uh, sort of were formed out of Indiana University, but are, are obviously have 
uh, are spread in, in, in various locations. And, and this has been important for us in terms of being able to uh, re-establish a, a, a good technical community and, and, de and development team who are really working on enhancing the, uh, the stability of the platform as well as making sure that we can start to integrate other data sources as well. So we see a, a good combination here with being able to work with uh, health data in the future because obviously things like adverse event data is very relevant to doing research as well. So this, this partnership with data to discovery is important for our, our, future, our current releases as well as broadening the applicability of, of open facts and, and the potential of building on the experience of data discovery in, in, in the realms mentioned there as well. Just coming back to uh, where we are with our, our release plans, and, and we certainly welcome uh, input to this in sense of if people are interested in trying out our, our alpha versions, which we have available at the moment, then uh, that would be that would be really good to get people's early insight to that. So just to, to just to sort of give an update on where we are in, in July uh, 2017, we're currently working on a data release that will include a number of, of data source updates, including Kemble 23. And we're also working on a, a slightly uh, later chemistry total refresh of our uh, chemistry, uh, our standardized chemistry database. And as I mentioned before, there's been a lot of hard work on the, uh, the, the text search within open facts and we, we've certainly got alpha versions of that that we'd love to get people's thoughts on in terms of how we might mutually rank uh, the returns from a text-based search as well as we realize that that's been a very valuable entry point to to the wider data sources in, in open facts as well and then later in the summer and and we we plan on doing a more regular refresh program as well as updating the remaining sources and I think as, as perhaps will be covered later, the, uh, the importance of the workflows as access points are, are very, uh, it, it is, we're pleased to know that we've got some updated nine nodes coming through once we, we, we finalize the latest API, as well as, as pipeline pilot nodes as well that we, we, we have, that people have access to at the moment uh, through, uh, through that work. So I think this uh, is, is the point where I wanted to sort of leave the view of the audience with a few questions and hopefully this will, will spur on some of the questions that you might ask later on. I think uh, what we definitely are keen to do is broaden out the, the usage of open facts within the, the virtual screening uh, type workflows. And the way that we potentially see that is if we can come and define some, some typical business questions that people want to answer. And not, not just uh, in terms of the, the, the answer, but perhaps even in terms of what data sources would really help them and how we can obviously improve the throughput if, if throughput's an issue for this type of question. Uh, so we definitely want to hear from you on, on that. And, and I think some other points of interest that you might want to have is, as I say, future cooperation. So uh, we certainly welcome people getting involved in the project. And, and both contributing to the code and contributing to our, our project meetings and so on. So with that, uh, I'd like to perhaps acknowledge and thank uh, many of all the people that have contributed to Open Facts uh, now and in the past, and, and hand back to Adam and, and the other speakers to, uh, to carry on the webinar, but certainly welcome questions at the end or, or after the event. Thank you very much, Nick. Um, that's a a good overview and um, as Nick said I think uh, we're just going to run through our three presentations today uh, and we'll save the questions to the end but you can type them into the question box at any time uh, to make sure you don't don't forget them and to make sure that we uh, have time to get through them all so um, I'm going to now pass control over to Justine who's going to make the next um, presentation uh, and Stian, don't forget to unmute your mic as well. Hello. So I'm going to uh, dive a bit more into the deployment and architecture behind it. I can't show much of the details, but the slides are will be available, and you can follow all the hyperlinks in there for more information. And 
Uh, I'm just going to walk straight in through it. Uh, Nick mentioned the, the web services, and that's basically the core of how the OpenFax API is exposed. There's, I think, about 40 different web services, depending on what you want to ask for, and they're also all on the dev site that you see there. And uh, programmatically, you can get it in your usual formats, your JSON or your XML, and you just pick up the particular attribute you want. And then you can see how it has merged in from the different data sources, so you don't need to deal with the different identifiers. Uh, I want to talk a bit more about Docker, because that's now how we deploy OpenFax in the live production system, and that is our container technology that have become very popular now in uh, particularly in cloud deployments open fact as well as now running on cloud instances the core principle is that you have an image is basically a, sh a very tiny file system of a particular service one application when you deploy uh, unlike just flat virtual machines for docker you make one service one Docker image, and those then become microservices that talk to each other. So you will have the database separate from the web server and so on. And this is the cloud's best friend in a way because you can maintain each of those separately. So that's just what we're now using in OpenFax. So if you just look at the different images we use just for OpenFax, you have all these yellow boxes. You have the web interface, the explorer, and then you have the API, which is doing the queries against a triple store underneath. So there are several images to start up, and they will kind of talk to each other and need to communicate. And to, to kind of spin it up, we use something called Docker Compose, which we help to set up, which, which wires it all together. It's, it's quite a lightweight way of setting it up, and then it will start all the different images. And this is crucial because you can customize each of these images to add additional data sources, to expose different ports, and so on. So deployment-wise, that is quite important for uh, exposing the whole OpenFax architecture in a flexible way, particularly, as uh, Nick mentioned, uh, companies want to, to tweak something or have it for private purposes. So when you, when you start it up, well, first it will just get the software, you will see lots of downloading, blah, 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 and then after that, it will not start immediately because OpenFax is actually quite big. Once you have it installed, it can be like 200 gigabytes, well, while downloading is only 20 gigabytes. RDF compresses quite well, as you might know. But to get it started, it needs to do that kind of staging phase of getting the data. So the Docker Compose will take care of all of that. Uh, and then finally, uh, yeah, sorry, uh, you will start up the services. If you look at the logs, you don't need to do that, but then you will see all the different colors of what's flying around. So if you're ch changing the queries and so on, that's what you would have to look at. Now. That sounds a bit detailed, so most people wouldn't want to see that. That's only if you want to have your own install that you need to deal with this. Uh, we are looking at in the BioXL project to go kind of go back again to making a, a, a big, fat virtual machine image, if you like, and uh, that's part of our BioXL portal that we are developing with the EBI and Elixir, is to simplify deployment of these kind of uh, images onto different grid and cloud providers, working with the EGI and Amazon and so on. And here you, you see it's basically browsing the BioXL collection of tools, and uh, uh, this is a bit fiction because we haven't got a blue deploy button for OpenFax yet, but that's what we're working on right now. We have it already for uh, the comps workflow system but that you can deploy it in Mongo. And then all these composed things that you, I showed before will have already been done for you. So you don't need to wait for the data download because on the grid infrastructure, you are okay to have these big data images. Now, how do we use OpenFax? Because you don't want to use those JSON uh, APIs directly on the command line. Most people use workflows, like Nick said. So there are two big workflow systems in cheminformatics. Pipeline Pilot is a very popular one, particularly with uh, industry users. And uh, you can install the OpenFax component uh, using that. There's a separate webinar from uh, OpenFax, which, which uh, Nick, which you can find on the OpenFax website, which explains this in more detail. There's also the NIME node, which is under development now. There was a prototype, and now there's a new stabilized version, which allows you to use any of the API calls 
uh, within the Nine workflow system, uh, which is an open source system, and uh, in here you can customize it to use different installations. So by default, it will use the public API, but if you had set up your own instance, you can change it in preferences to use uh, the deployed open facts. And then you can combine it with all the other powerful chem informatics tools that you can find in NIME for comparing structures and so on. Now, what we've been looking at in BioExcel is kind of, uh, many people are wondering, but which workflow system should I use? And this has been a common problem, particularly in the bioinformatics field, there's even more and more workflow systems coming up, uh, particularly as people are doing next-gen sequencing and so on. And one thing that has sprung out from that community is something called common workflow language. Now, it's not bioinformatics specific, it is our pipeline uh, language, but it's a generic and implemented by many different workflow engines, so you're not tied into one particular system anymore, but you can express it on a, on a tool and step level uh, to combine uh, your pipeline of tools that you want to execute. And uh, the inspiration behind it is, is, is coming from Docker and command line tools, what we've been looking at in BioExcel is to extend this also to do web service calls to open fax, and then particularly we need to have it parameterized because it could be different instances. Now, one thing we find with CWL was that while it is a standard format that you can write by hand or you can save it from the other workflow systems, it didn't have a good web presence. So we made the CWL viewer, which allows you to given a URL of a workflow, you can go and in inspect it and have a look what the different steps are and share it with others. And there you can see the annotations. If you had bothered to put them in, you can just des describe the individual steps of the workflow. So that's a good way to convey what you're doing in the workflow to others, particularly for academic users who want to publish. It's a good to have uh, a linkable web page that you can describe it independent of how you run it. Now, you can read more about what we're doing in BioExcel uh, on our website, where there's uh, the workflows page, and how you can read about the different systems, and in particular, you can read about the workflow blocks, which is a way to generate little components of uh, workflow fragments that you can then combine to custom workflows. And Adam Hospital will talk more about that in just a minute. And uh, you can use the Ask BioExcel EU website where we have added, I've added a new question in there where you can ask questions about this and anything else about workflows. Open facts have their own support system, but I've added links to those as well, so you can see there. And of course, you can ask any questions in during the webinar uh, using the webinar system. So that's it for me, and I think Adam will pass over to Adam. Thank you very much, Stian. Yes, um, so now I'm just going to take back control uh, and advance the slides for Adam Hospital. Um, Adam, um, can you see the slides now? You should be able to. Um, you should be able to. Yes. Start your, your talk. Yep. Hope you can hear me. Yep. Yes. Okay. So my name is Adam Hospital, and I'm going to present you the, the last part of this webinar, where uh, with just five slides, uh, I will try to show you the, the interaction between this BioExcel Center of Excellence and, and the OpenFAX platform. Uh, if you can pass the slide, please. Yes, fantastic. Uh, the collaboration started with the definition of one of our pilot use cases in the project. In, in BioExcel, we are working on five different uh, pilot use cases that you can discover if you go to our webpage. You have the link in, in this slide. Um, these pilot use cases are real scientific problems, uh, mainly involving high throughput analysis or high performance computing simulations, uh, calculations, in different fields, such as uh, genomics, molecular recognition, free energy simulations, and uh, also molecular dynamics, and even QMMM uh, simulations. Um, it is in one of these pilot use cases uh, that we want to design and develop a complete virtual screening pipeline, like the one that you can see represented in, in, his, in this slide. And here is where OpenFacts can help us a lot, and we'll see that in a minute. But first of all, uh, 
for the ones that are not familiar with virtual scanning technique, um, virtual scanning is a, it's a computational technique that is being widely used nowadays, especially in pharma companies, um, for the drug discovery process. Um, but, but the goal mainly is to filter com compound libraries, that, uh, libraries that can, can contain up to millions of uh, structures, to just a few hundreds, um, using a set of qu qualities or, or looking for a set of qualities or partic particularities such as uh, geometric or electronic complementarity, dry likeness, uh, size, toxicity of the ligand, of the compound, uh, etc. Then reducing the number of compounds, uh, basically from millions to just hundreds, that gives the possibility to start in vitro testings or, or, or optimization processes that, that uh, wouldn't have been possible with millions of compounds, as, as you may know. And of course, that is uh, saving lots of money uh, also to the company. Um, you can see this process represented in the, in the figure uh, on the left part of the slide. Um, with uh, lots of compounds together with protein receptors uh, in, the, in the top of the funnel, and just a few of possible protein ligand complexes uh, as a result of the pipeline at the bottom of the funnel. Uh, this pipeline, the, the virtual skinning pipeline, can be divided in three main parts, as, as you can see on the right hand of the slide, the retrieval of molecules, the structure modeling, and the recognition process. Okay, the first part of the pipeline consists of the retrieval of a, a library of compounds, uh, also a set of decoys related to these compounds that, that are inactive compounds to be used mainly for validation, and receptors, a set of receptors that, that usually are proteins with a certain ability to dock uh, the ligands. So we, it's precisely in this point where we're going to use the power offered by, by open facts so, and for a number of different reasons, uh, because of the number of different databases included in open facts, because of the possibility to link these different databases uh, using uh, the, the API because of the power that this API uh, has, uh, etc. For, for all of these reasons and, and for what you've seen, for what you've seen uh, during the presentation, the Nick's presentation uh, and also Stian, we chose OpenFAX platform for, for this particular part of the pipeline. And uh, as the title of the webinar says, uh, we do not want to use uh, open facts uh, um, to build, uh, just to use open facts directly from the API, let's say, but we want to build pharmacological workflow blocks for virtual screening using this API. And I will show you that uh, what that means in a, in a couple of the slides. So now uh, to finish with the virtual screening pipeline, no, no, okay. <laughs> Thank you, Adam. Uh, the, the second part of the, of the pipeline that you have in the slide is uh, the most computationally expensive part, where we want to model the structures, uh, either for the ligand as uh, for also for the receptor that are usually proteins. Um, and we want to complicate things a little bit more in BioXL, because we want to take advantage of our exascale expertise, and uh, we want to take into account receptor flexibility. And for that, uh, we want to run molecular dynamic simulations on, on these receptors to basically obtain a set of structure ensembles for each of the receptors, a set of conformations for each of the receptor. And finally, the, the last step of the pipeline uh, with a set of compounds and receptors and also different conformations uh, representing the flexibility, um, we are going to run biomolecular docking programs. Um, and then obtaining the protein ligand complexes. And then the, the last part of the pipeline is select the best ones with the final scoring and analysis process. So if you are interested in having more information about the particular uh, virtual screening use case, uh, you can click at the link at the bottom of the slide and you'll find a description with, with further details. So next slide, please. Uh, Okay, so in the previous one, uh, I said we wanted to build pharmacological workflow blocks for the virtual screening with open facts. By why do we want to build these uh, workflow blocks? Uh, I mean, why don't we use just uh, the API directly? And we think this is important uh, uh, because we think scientific workflows are extremely important. And, and this is actually one of the goals of the Center of Excellence. And you have this written in this slide, uh, one of the goals of BioXL Center of Excellence is to increase the usability of European infrastructures by providing easy access to computing and data resources. And 
we are doing that by designing, deploying, and making available biomolecular workflows. So uh, I I'm sure you know, uh, I'm sure you have uh, used scientific workflows uh, before, but uh, our systems widely used in scientific groups uh, and mainly are used as a way to organize and execute pipelines and that are usually a list of command line tools. But they have a lot of advantages uh, comparing them to a list of command line tools. Uh, as you, you have seen in the STEAM's presentation, they can be described and shown graphically uh, with uh, different viewers and you can see an example in this slide. And they can be stored and shared. For example, uh, you have examples in my experiment webpage. Uh, they increase reproducibility and also provide provenance uh, and they can be used to uh, automatically extract uh, dependencies in parallel applications. And so they have a lot of advantages. Uh, again, if you want more information about BioXL and, and the work that we're doing in workflows, uh, as you've seen in the STEAMS presentation, we have all the information in the in the BioXL webpage. Uh, I've put a, um, an example uh, in this slide, a specific workflow, uh, just to show you how difficult the process can be, sometimes even processes that uh, appears to be easy, like this one. Uh, this one, all of the workflow steps of this one are needed to just prepare a protein structure that you can find in the protein data bank, in the PDB, to a structure that is ready to be used as an input in a molecular dynamic simulation, just to prepare. Just uh, uh, obtaining a system with a box of water molecules, counter ions surrounding the protein, uh, and having a system energetically equilibrated. We need all of these steps to just prepare the protein. So what we are doing in BioXL is to transform all of these boxes that you can see here into workflow blocks. And then this uh, workflow box can be easily used, first used and then interconnected with other building blocks, such as the ones that we are developing with the OpenFAX library. And how are we doing that? This is the next slide. Thank you, Al. Uh, in BioCell, we decided to implement these workflow blocks as a set of Python wrappers just that set of Python wrappers. So in the particular example of the molecular dynamics setup, we, we started from the previous uh, diagram and we converted every box, every process or task to a building block. Uh, this building block all have the same structure, inputs, outputs, and the same syntax for the parameters. In this case, we are using YAML files so that they can be easily interconnected uh, and that makes them interoperable, uh, as I said before. This methodology also makes them workflow manager agnostic, and that means that they can be used with different workflow managers. Uh, so think about them as just a wrapper to a particular piece of code. Uh, and of course, as you can see in the right hand part, uh, a whole workflow as complicated as the one that, uh, that I've shown you in the previous slide, the Molecular Dynamics Setup, can also be wrapped in just a single building block. This is the one that uh, is called prepare structure, uh, the blue box just after the recover protein structure. And then we can use this building block that is a, a complex workflow as it was just a single tool using this methodology. So uh, as I said before, these workflows can be run using different workflow managers. This is the last part of this slide, such as, for example, here you have PyComs, Galaxy, and Toil. Uh, and depending on the context, you might want to use one or another. So for example, if you're interested in running your workflow in HPC centers, if you are interested in using hundreds of processors in parallel, uh, you have PyComs or Toil that maybe are more suited uh, for that. But if you just want to run your workflow, test your workflow in your own workstation, uh, analyzing intermediate results or changing uh, input parameters, then maybe you can use Galaxy or Taverna. Uh, our building blocks can be used in all of these workflow managers. So once in the final part, once the workflow is designed, uh, it, it can also be described using a common workflow language. And that has been presented before by ST in this webinar. Uh, we in BioXL, we are uh, describing all our workflows in CWL. And again, you can find more information about all of that in a document that I, that I uh, put a link on this slide at the bottom of the slide. So next slide. 
um, once we have our workflows implemented using this uh, library, this Python wrapper library, uh, I said that we could run them using different workflow managers, but we also can uh, run them on a large variety of uh, computational infrastructure, as you can see in this slide. So in, in this case, again, uh, using the MD, the molecular dynamic setup uh, workflow that I showed you before, we tested it in personal computers, so for example, in your own workstation. We tested it in virtual machines running in private clouds, so for example, like Open Nebula or OpenStack, or, and also we tested these in virtual machines running in public cloud infrastructures like EGI or, or Embassy Cloud. And of course, we also tried that in HPC supercomputers like uh, the Mare Nostrum supercomputer that is placed in a Barcelona supercomputing center. And all of this using the very same code, the code that you can download and install from uh, our BioExcel um, GitHub repository that you uh, see in this slide. So um, now that I have presented the connection between BioExcel and the workflows, um, I, I can go back to the virtual screening pipeline that is the subject of this webinar. And, and if you click, Adam, yes, our idea is to take advantage of the uh, right hand part of the slide, so HPC centers, because we want to run that in a massively parallel environment as can be a supercomputer. So as you can imagine, to perform an extensive virtual screening of a huge compound library, remember millions of uh, ligands, millions of compounds, in, and if you want to include docking in different conformational ensembles of the receptor, and we also can go even further and uh, and mutate uh, some sequence variants on the proteins and use them also as a receptors. All of this is a challenging process and, and approaches the exascale level. And of, of course, also, it depends on the, on the characteristics of the system, on the, on the size of the system, mainly. But if, if we can run this workflow efficiently in a massively parallel environment, such as supercomputer, that can give us the opportunity to scan millions of compounds. And that is essentially what we want to achieve uh, in this use case in BioExcel. So the last slide is finally the pipeline. This pipeline that you're seeing here is the first prototype of our workflow. Uh, and as you can see, we will use OpenFacts, of course, to retrieve the library of compounds and also receptors uh, using our workflow blocks that we are developing. And uh, we are using the directory of useful decoys uh, database to retrieve the decoys. Um, <clears throat> for else, um, for the protein receptors, uh, as I said, we, we want to obtain ensembles of different conformations. And for that, we will use a Gromas molecular dynamics package, which, by the way, is one of the main codes in Bioxel project, as uh, Adam introduced uh, you before. And finally, we will put all together receptor conformations, compounds, decoys, uh, all together and run a massive docking procedure using, for example, one of the programs that is the Haddock program uh, for protein ligand docking, which is also one of the main codes uh, in the BioCell project. Uh, as a first step to our goal, we want to implement this workflow. And also, we want to validate it, of course. And to validate it, we will work with a real scientific example. An example, we, we have chosen an example that is widely studied by the pharmaceutical industry with lots and lots of information available. And, and that is uh, EGFR. I'm sure you know that, the epidermal growth factor receptor. That is a, a transmembrane receptor located on the cell membrane and, and is associated to various types of cancer. And, and just for that, it's representing an important drug target. Uh, again, if you want to know more about this example, the EGFR validation, etc., you can find more information in the link that you have uh, in this slide, uh, in the pilot use case sections of, of the BioExcel web page. Of course, we are not going to do that alone. Uh, we have a company that is called Nostrum Biodiscovery uh, that is placed in Barcelona Supercomputing Center that will supervise and help us during uh, all the validation process uh, and also will help us in the updates and evolution of, uh, of the whole pipeline. Uh, and of course, all the news results and information coming from this uh, use case will be published uh, regularly in our BioExcel webpage. And with that, I'll hand over the mic to our host, Adam. Thank you very much, Adam. Okay, so three different perspectives there of, uh, of open facts and how it's uh, being used and how it can fit into the, the other work of BioExcel. Uh, so thank you very much to 
all of our speakers today. It's now open to you guys uh, listening. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, now is the time to to ask them. So, as I mentioned before, the best thing to do is to um, use the question tab um, in go to webinar to to post your questions. So while you're thinking of some to type in there, um, the there was one immediate one that I had. It's probably a question for, for Nick. Um, I don't know if you are able to answer. But the question is really just for somebody who's less familiar with open facts. What what do you recommend is the best way to to get to know it and to to, to try it out and to to sort of explore what it what it has to offer? Uh, I mean, I think a couple of ways that will give people a good entry point to open facts is there is a tool called Explorer, where it, the link of which is available from our website, which is a, 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 a graphical uh, sort of client that uses the API and, and allows some fairly typical science questions to be asked around compound and by text etc and it sort of starts to show you the range of data that's in open facts and and I know in a way perhaps given what Adam was describing I, I think part of this is you know for your community is sort of understanding you know what what date what data sources you might want to uh, what what API calls you might want so Explorer will only go so far I think the key really is is perhaps looking at some of the uh, presentations on open facts and 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 particularly I know Daniela and others have done a lot of work on on trying to work on some of the workflow tools and there are there are some good examples and there's some stuff in our support pages which again is available from our our main URL but we've we've got a support uh, section that will give people some good entry points hopefully and, and we certainly welcome comments. That's great, Nick. Thank you. Um, so we've got our first question from from the audience, from Michael. Um, Michael, uh, if you have a microphone, I'm going to unmute you for a moment, and you can ask your question directly. If you don't, if I don't hear from you, then, uh, um, then okay. I can return your question. Okay, on you go, Michael. Thanks. Uh, thank you for um, this nice presentation. So it's really an interesting new platform. I was wondering if um, a virtual-based um, uh, setup uh, is uh, um, not bad performance-wise. I mean, it has a lot of advantages, of course, for developers, but uh, shouldn't this affect, affect performance? I, I guess I can answer that. Uh, yes, it could affect performance, uh, but that's also actually one reason why we have been looking at Docker, because when you use Docker, it's a much more lightweight uh, binding. It's not virtualization as such, it's more like you, like you get the clone of the kernel space in a sense, so you live outside the rest of the machine, and that means you can run the OpenFAX platform natively on the platform, for much better performance and use the disk directly and so on. And uh, so actually then you have a choice. Uh, if you run Docker on Windows or Mac, because it, uh, the, the Docker machines expects to be inside Linux, it will be within a virtual machine. But if you have a Linux host, it will run natively, but within its own little container space. And therefore you, don't, you get the much better performance. Thank you. Uh, just a question. So, if um, usually if I want to install a virtual machine, I have to have uh, root permissions or elevated permissions. Uh, is this also the case for this Docker application? It, it is the case also for Docker. There is there is uh, other uh, technologies that such uh, that uh, do not require root permissions, but we ha we haven't looked at those yet for open facts, but that is uh, particularly the case also in the HPC environments because you can't use root from an application point of view, obviously. Now, now, I'd, now we're not planning to deploy the open facts platform on the HPC architecture, but it, that's it's, uh, certainly uh, something that comes up a lot also in the common workflow language well because you, you should not need to have root access just to run an application. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Michael, for that. Um, I have another question from Carol. Uh, I think it's a fairly straightforward one, so I can probably just uh, 
recount it in this case. Um, Carol says that they have tried to get to HTTP Explorer 2 to openfacts.org to, to look at the Explorer, but um, is getting a message authentication parameters missing. Is that a temporary problem? Is that there should you need to be authenticated somewhere first, or is that meant to be meant to be public that anyone can look at? Yeah, I probably, we're just in the process of updating our platform, and I think that's a, a consequence of the update process we're running. So uh, apologies that it might not be available on that URL at the moment, but we can, if if you send me my, you send me your details, or we'll get them at the end. I can let you know when it's back online. Okay, uh, thanks, Nick, for that. Um, and the question from Michael was just asking about a link to the slides. Uh, they will be posted um, after the webinar, Michael. Uh, so Stian's one is already um, available. But I think he posted the, the link in the chat already. You may be able to see it. Um, Stian, maybe you could post that again. In terms of the rest of the presentations, because we had them from, from several places, I haven't posted them anywhere yet, but they will be made available online um, yeah. at, at SlideShare. Yeah, and then you, you just go and find the webinar page again on our website in, in a couple of weeks' time, uh, because I think we're going away in a conference, but after that, they should be on, on the same page where you found this webinar. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Carol and Michael. Um, any other questions from the floor? So before we wrap up, then I, I just I sort of had one other um, one other question myself, uh, and it was sort of be, the way Open Facts provides access to to so many of these different data sources, uh, that having the the single kind of point of access to them all is very powerful in itself. But I was wondering if that power extends to actually being able to to construct queries that that ask questions across multiple data sources in a, in a single query. Is that a kind of thing that open facts can can deal with or? Yes, I mean, de depending on the, the, the complexity of your business question, then I think this is maybe, you know, where perhaps a future discussion could be valuable. So the current API calls reflect the, the sort of typical questions that uh, we felt people wanted to answer uh, at the beginning and, and, and during the project. So there's about 60 API calls which are which commonly do cover more than one data source very, very often. So you might get data from Kemble, you might get patent data from Shaw Kemble, and you might also get pathways data. So those pre-canned queries do, do already cut across the multiple graphs that are loaded. And then the option that we're trying to introduce in, in future versions is both a Sparkle endpoint, which would allow you to craft your own queries and and, potentially, and obviously jump across uh, a federator query, sorry, user query that does, a tap, does query multiple graphs, as well as the option to create maybe a, a, a pre-canned call for very popular ones as we have done in, in the past. So, Yes, you can do it now, and, and certainly we want to do more of it in the future. Thank you very much, Nick. That, that's great. That makes it nice and, nice and clear. Um, so uh, just to follow up the previous question, um, there is a, a response in the, the chat at the moment that Stian's given um, in response to the performance question, just to say that, uh, yeah, Stian, do you want to comment? Yeah, yeah, just I had to Google the right link. So Singularity and Shifter are the two container technologies that are popular, not requiring root access. Uh, but that means you have to choose. But there's also an initiative called Open Container Initiative, uh, which is trying to standardize the definitions and so on between those. And uh, so you don't have to do define the containers again in each of those. And, and CWL is also working on using open containers so that you can mix and match these things. Great. Thank you, Stian. And I think we've got time for one last question. There's another question from Carol. It sounds like a more um, scientific question, so I'm going to open the mic if you, if you want to pose the question yourself. And if I don't hear from you, I'll recount the question. But, but Carol, do you want to ask it directly? 
okay, so I'm not hearing at the moment. So I'll just re recount the question. It was a question to Adam, uh, and it was, um, how do you deal with preparation of structures of ligand within workflow? Do you use XTAL structures or rather generation of 3D from smiles or or INCIS? Is that INCIS? Um, yes. Adam, would you like to comment? So, so far, we are not uh, dealing with preparation of uh, ligand structures in the in the workflow that you that you already have in the GitHub of BioXL in this macrodynamic setup. But what we are doing is to move all the the work that we did a long time ago in uh, a server that is called MD Web here in Barcelona. You have also a webinar. Uh, I can publicize a little bit that you have a webinar in BioXL. Uh, for by, uh, MD Web also, you have the link in the chat now if you want to see what the web server offers. But the thing is that in the web server, you could directly um, upload your ligand parameters and work with these parameters. Uh, now we are working on a way to automatically extract these parameters also using AC pipe. Uh, and we can also do that from Smiles or Inchikis uh, if you want. So we are we, we, we have thought about that and we are working on that and we will have that uh, sooner, hopefully. Okay, thank you very much, Adam. Well, I think um, we're pretty much out of time for today. Thank you very much for for coming along and um, for your questions this afternoon. Uh, as I mentioned before, if you do have any further questions, you can you can post them later on ask.bioexcel.eu. Um, and in the meantime, uh, thank you for coming along today. We do have a, another webinar on Thursday. If you're interested in, in finding out more about what BioXL is doing and keeping up with the, the webinars, you can uh, find us at bioxl.eu slash webinars. Okay, uh, thank you all very much for coming along today. And a final thank you to our speakers. Uh, and um, we will speak to you all again soon. Thank you.